we're going to talk about genetic considerations uh, to reducing calving problems, um, as Les referred to. And so, as you guys know from any of my past talks, that uh, certainly the EPDs are the, the tool to go with. It's the best tool that we have for making any of our selection decisions for the traits that are important. But probably as important as anything uh, would be for the, the, the calving ease. Uh, the calving ease EPD is the single best measurement to use. A lot of people want to still look at the EPD, but also kind of weigh in the birth weight and the birth weight EPD. Uh, adding that information does not give you any better estimate um, than than just using it, then you get with having just the calving ease EPD alone. So I know it's hard not to pay attention to those other traits, but they really don't do anything to improve your selection. They actually, uh, it, it, go, it works the other way. It, it actually reduces your effectiveness. The reason EPDs work as well as they do is because they do use a lot of information. They use the actual measurement of the bull, his actual birth weight, his actual calving ease scores that same information on all of his re relatives. Uh, if you've done genomic testing, it uses that information. And also uh, the, the, it, it takes account of preferred, uh, pre preferential management or environment. So it takes all this into account to give us the single best tool that we can use for selection. And here's the thing to remember, it is a risk management tool. It is not a perfect science. You can buy a bull that, that, that by all indications is going to be a calving ease bull based on his EPDs and have to pull some calves. That's a fact of life, but it will absolutely reduce making those kind of mistakes uh, as opposed to just using the birth weight, actual birth weight or birth weight EPD, you would make more mistakes. So for when we want to look at how to use EPDs, the calving ease direct EPDs, uh, here's a couple of Charlay bulls. The bull on the left has a 10 pound or a, a 10 calving ease direct EPD, and the bull on the right has a plus three calving ease direct EPD. So what this means is, is if we were to breed these two bulls to an equal group of heifers, and we then looked at the calving difficulty that we had in those heifers, we would expect there to be a 7% difference with the bull on the left, uh, reducing the amount of calving difficulty in that herd by about 7%, okay? So significant improvement. So if you had a herd of 100 uh, and you bred those two bulls, excuse me, I, for some reason it's on automatic advance and it's driving me crazy. I didn't get that turned off. Um, so for this situation, this bull on the left, the higher value calving ease direct means that that would be the better bull uh, for assuring that you had calving ease when you use these bulls. Now the percentages have to do with when they're bred to heifers. I just wanna point that out. However, this we would still, even on mature cows, this bull would be the easier calving bull to use on mature cows as well. The, percentages might not be the same. Uh, it probably would be a lower degree of percent on, on cows, but he would still be the better to use, bull to use on cows for calving ease. We also have, the most of the breeds give us a calving ease maternal EPD as well. And now those work a little different, so we need to, to be aware of, of how those work. And it's an actual generation further down is where we see the results. So if we were to breed these two bulls to equal females and keep back their replacement daughters, their replacement daughters, this bull's replacement daughters would have reduced calving difficulty by about 5% compared to the calves, the daughters produced by this bull. And that's the situation. We bred these bulls to equal set of cows, and then we used a similar type bull to breed to their daughters under similar management as well. Uh, then this is the bull that we would expect his daughters to be easier calvers. This EPD has not been used as much as the calving ease direct. Uh, I really encourage producers to, if they're going to be keeping back replacement females, uh, to pay more attention to this EPD and, and make sure that we can get the calving ease uh, in those daughters that we're producing as well. 
So let's look at, at how we need to assess the level of calving ease that we need. Uh, and, and the first one I'm going to talk about is how much time is spent with the herd during calving. Uh, and, and you look at this, this picture over here and you see this farmer pulling a calf and everybody can say, oh, that's terrible. In actuality, that's not terrible. At least he was able to see that the cow needed assistance and provide it. But for a lot of you guys that, that are part-time farmers and, and aren't able to be uh, with the herd um, for, you know, most of the day or, or even at night, you're only able to, to, to look at them during calving season a few times, uh, you might not get this opportunity. And what you end up with is a dead cow and a calf. So, uh, so the part-time farmer absolutely has to put more emphasis on calving ease than somebody that is able to spend a lot of time or hire some labor uh, to look after the, the, the cattle uh, during calving ease. Uh, and, and so the other situation is, is like I said, if you're able to provide labor resources, then, then that can help too. So how many heifers to breed? Uh, it depends. So in other words, are you going to be breeding the bull to all mature cows? If the bull is going to be bred to all mature cows, you actually really, from a calving ease direct EPD standpoint, uh, you just need to avoid the extremely hard calving bulls. You don't necessarily need to shoot for the limits and get that extreme high calving ease direct EPD bull, uh, particularly if you're breeding to all mature cows. You can greatly relax that restriction, uh, and that way you're allowed to put maybe some more growth or, or other performance characteristics that you want into them. Even if you're breeding to all heifers, I, I think that we don't in most cases, and particularly in like the British breeds, uh, we don't have to shoot for the moon. We don't have to get the absolute highest calving ease direct bull to breed to those heifers. We need to kind of find a, a level that, that we're comfortable with where we don't. And, and my, my argument is always, I want as little calving ease direct as I can get but still not to have to pull any calves uh, due to that uh, situation that Dr. Anderson is talking about where the calf is too big uh, for the opening it's trying to come through. Uh, now you can't do anything about those uh, malpresentations or anything. Uh, and so um, don't, go, don't go off the deep end here. Keep it, you know, get enough calving ease in the bull to, so that you don't have to pull calves. Uh, but if you get it too high, you often have to give up a lot of, of, of uh, growth or other performance characteristics. So overall, look at it as the percent of heifers. So do you have, you know, you're breeding this bull to 30 females. Ah, sorry. You're breeding this bull to 30 females. Well, are two of them heifers? If so, then I'm going to treat it pretty close to, to all mature cows, uh, but maybe a little bit extra calving ease just to help out those, those couple of heifers and definitely would want to keep a closer eye on those heifers, uh, particularly as they look like they're approaching calving. Um, and so, but now if on the other end, it's, you know, 15, uh, 10, 15 of those heifer, or of those females are heifers, uh, then you probably want to treat it a little more closer to as if you were trying to buy a bull for all heifers. And so once again, trying to reduce our losses uh, for the most part um, by getting that right level of calving ease to, to, so that we don't have to assist, but don't have to give up too much production in, in, as well. So what if you aren't familiar with how the EPDs work? I want to show you an important thing. And, and now this is what we call an EPD percentile table. And I've gone, some of you have seen this before, like in Master Cattlemen and all, but I just wanted to go through again, kind of how this, uh, how it works. It, so for the breed that you're considering buying, then you would need to, to go to their website and find their percentile tables. And most all breeds provide this for you. Uh, and let's say we have this example of this bull up top, this Simmental bull. Well, for calving ease direct, and, and, and here's the other thing in terms of nomenclature. If they don't put anything, it's just CE or calving ease, that is calving ease direct. The one that's going to be for maternal is going to always be either maternal calving ease or calving ease maternal. So you may see it as CEM. Okay, so we find that column for calving ease direct. 
And then we come down and we find where 14 is and you see it kind of falls in between those two spaces. So what that tells us is, is that that bull ranks within the Simmental breed between the top 10 to 15% in the breed for calving ease. So that would be uh, for the Simmental breed, a good calving ease bull. What about calving ease maternal? We find that EPD, we find that column come down and we see that now we hit right at about 55%. So from a calving ease maternal standpoint, this bull isn't quite as good, right? Now, I'm not saying that's a bad value. Actually, you know, being breed average for calving ease maternal is probably, uh, it's not the greatest sin in the world for sure, uh, because you're still gonna wanna use a calving ease bull on those heifers uh, when they come, regardless if they have are born from a bull that had a high maternal calving ease or not. Uh, I usually look at the calving ease maternal as to kind of avoid those, if I'm keeping back daughters, avoid those bulls that are down here on the very low end for calving ease maternal, as opposed to necessarily trying to select for one that's on the very high end for calving ease maternal. So like I say, that value, even though it's lower than what that bull was for his calving ease direct, it's still not uh, an absurdly bad number, and, and I would certainly still consider that bull um, to, you know, even if I was keeping back daughters. We have a fact sheet, it's called ASC 211, uh, and it goes through the, the definition of the different traits uh, for, for many of the breeds and the nomenclature that, is, that are used. Uh, now, remember, these charts are breed specific. You can't use that same chart for an Angus bull or a Charlay bull or anything else. They are breed specific. They are updated periodically. And uh, I usually, you're going to have different, if you, when you go on that website, you're going to have different charts that they'll show you. They'll have one for dams. They have one for young sires. I usually like to use the one for active sires. I think that gives you the best overall picture of kind of where that bull falls within the breed. So C stock producers, you need to send in your calving ease data. Dr. Anderson talked about taking those calving ease scores and I concur 100% and we need to be collecting birth weight data uh, and send that data to your breed association. And, and so yeah, it looks like I missed a T, didn't I? Um, so, with the, with the birth weight data, you might say, well, you told us that, that we aren't supposed to be using that. And I'm telling commercial guys, when you're going to buy a bull, don't pay attention to the birth weight of that bull. But the seed stock producer still needs to weigh that bull and send that data in because that data actually helps to compute the calving ease EPD on the bull. And so it's a critical piece of information uh, that you need to send in if you're a seed stock producer. I highly encourage you to genomically test through your breed association. This is becoming extremely important. The, the technology has matured to the point, many of you will remember in the early stages of, of genomic testing, I was not a big fan. Uh, we're to the point now where that technology has matured to the point where it's very beneficial. Uh, if you have your bull genomically tested, it will actually be the same as if you have, have bought that bull and he has had about 25 calves or so that we have good calving ease data on those 25 calves. Uh, just doing a simple genomics test on that bull gives us the same amount of information as raising that bull breeding him to the cows and getting that much data back. So, so it's about, it, it, it really advances us about two to three years over what it would take to get that level of accuracy uh, by doing it the traditional way. So taking care of these practices, what we're doing is, is if we're sending in all of our data, if we're genomically testing, what we're doing is improving the accuracy of that bull and not only for calving ease, but for all of the traits that are important to us. And you commercial guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relay to you right now, there is value in this increased accuracy. So if your seed stock provider is putting forth that cost, and it's generally in the, the, uh, the $40 range uh, to have this, this done, and, and 
you know, it's worth it for you to pay another $50 to that seed stock guy to, to get that additional comfort uh, that, that you have more accuracy and, and that's a more reliable EPD. You remember I said it, it was, a, it was a, a risk management tool. And what that does is when you have higher accuracy, it reduces the risk that you're taking by, by using that EPD. So, uh, so we, we do need to appreciate that uh, in our six seed stock producers that are doing this genomic testing. Uh, we'll also point out for those of you that participate in the CAPE program that starting this year, every bull that's sold through the CAPE needs to be genomically tested or at least have a 0.3 accuracy or higher for calving ease in, in order to qualify uh, regardless of what his EPDs are. So, um, so that's coming in the future, uh, that, that requirement for, for genomically testing those bulls going through the CAPE program. Few misconceptions I want to go through. Birth weight is the best tool for selecting a calving ease bull. Like I said, misconception. That's not a quote or a piece of advice. Uh, that's telling you that, that that is not true. Head size and shoulder width should be carefully analyzed and play a role in the bull selection. Once again, a non-truth that's a common misconception. There's been a lot of research that's done on this very thing and no one has shown any correlation whatsoever between the head size and shoulder width that contributed to the calving difficulty or ease of that bull. So a lot of people do it, I know that, but it, it, you're, it's a waste of your effort and it actually uh, makes using that calving ease direct alone uh, less effective. Feed your cows less during the last trimester to reduce birth weight and thus calving difficulty. I'm gonna tell you right now, to reduce birth weight of that calf, you have to flat starve them hard, okay, in order to, to reduce the birth weight to start with. And I can tell you that this part is absolutely false because if you starve them to the level that you've reduced the birth weight, you've made a weaker cow that has a harder time calving. So uh, what has been shown is, is this has the opposite effect of what you want. You might get a little lighter calf, but you're gonna have more calving difficulty. And the last is crossbreeding leads to increased calving difficulty. Another misconception. Now, once again, crossbreeding does slightly increase the birth weight of the crossbred calf, but it does not result in more calving difficulty. Okay, so that's the beauty of it. So because that calf is does have the hybrid vigor, it's able to, to calve out without assistance just as well as its straight bred counterpart that might weigh just a little bit less. So again, these are things that we should not be paying attention to. We need to, to use the proper information and not some of these misconceptions that are very prominent in the beef industry. So in summary, if you're wanting to buy a bull that, that you're gonna breed to heifers or, or your cows and you want to make sure he is a calving ease bull, that's the calving ease direct EPD. Now the level that you need, once again, has to do with that heifer to cow ratio that you're gonna be breeding the bull to and the amount of time that's spent with the females during calving. Calving ease maternal, on the other hand, is giving you an indicator of that bull's daughters. So if you're keeping replacements back, then higher values means that bull's daughters will be easier calvers, but you still need to, to Buy, the bull you're buying to breed to those heifers still needs to be an adequately calving ease direct bull. Uh, you can't if you you can't say, well, I'm using calving ease maternal to make my heifers easier calvers, so I don't have to worry about the calving ease of the bull. I'm going to breed to them. That's not correct either. So uh, make sure that that you that you utilize both of these tools uh, to help. So. That's gonna be it, Katie, for me. I wanna just put this up here to, to let you know that our the next session is gonna be February 16th, uh, and it's gonna be weed, ma weed management for pastors. And we have uh, Dr. J.D. Green that's gonna be on to, to give that presentation. 